Praise the Lord, Lancaster Church of God. Can I get a horn along this morning? <laughs> Praise the Lord for everybody that has come out today. It is so awesome to uh, be on in God's presence with you this morning. Amen. And uh, I'm excited that we can be here and once again be able to have beautiful weather to uh, be able to have an outside service. And um, we want to invite anybody that's in the area. Um, if you are in the area um, and want to be able to come out, uh, we have plenty of room. So feel free to come out and to be with us. But is it exciting to be in the house of the Lord this morning? This is the day that the Lord hath made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. <laughs> And so it is just awesome to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, Sister Hope. Good morning. I'm going to say good morning. It's so nice to see your smiling faces again. I've been able to come together. I can't wait till we can actually move back inside. But I do like it outside. It's more free, I think. Um, but I just want to say God is so good. And I'm so happy that we have another beautiful day. A little cool, but it's a beautiful day. And I want to remind everybody, go on our website on the Lancaster Church of God. All of our, everything, our Bible teachings have been uploaded there, and every night of the week we have something going on. Um, on Sunday mornings, we have Brother Chris teaching the youth from the Word of God with the Bible study. Monday night, I'm teaching the ladies at 7 p.m. Tuesday night is the men. Wednesday night is our Wednesday night Bible study by Brother Phil. Thursday night is our worship service. Um, just a word from God and a time of prayer. And then Friday night, Josh is um, teaching again from the youth and from um, Chalice Ministries. And then Saturday night, we have Pat with the music ministry. And then here we are again on Sunday. So I'm thankful for what God is doing. In a time like this, God is still in control. And God is still on the throne. So let's have a time together and a time of worship today. Hey Amen. I just want to re rejoice and just let everybody know I, we were actually asked this past week, I was asked by the Ministers Association to give all of our services over to uh, Cliffview. Um, they've got some residents there, and so if they are watching today, welcome. Um, but it's just a great opportunity, church, because others are hearing the things that are going on. And uh, all of you that are doing that, I just am so thankful for that. Um, as everyone knows here at the Lancaster Church of God, we always start off our uh, worship service with our giving. And uh, I believe with all my heart that giving is a part of worship. Amen? If you believe that, honk a horn. Amen. And the, and the thing is, is that we are able to give because God blesses us. And I had told several people about the scripture the Lord had put in my heart as I began to pray for churches and seeing churches getting concerned about finance. And I began to pray about that. And I started asking the Lord in regards to that. Uh, Lord, you know, you could almost, it was, it was sort of like a little fear that would come in about what, you know, what was going to happen with the church, with the finances. And the Lord gave me a scripture in this past week, which was really, really cool. Uh, when he gave me the scripture, um, or I was reading my book for the fear of the Lord, the scripture that the Lord had actually gave me was in that reading. And um, it was just a confirmation of what the Lord had showed me. And the reason I want to share it with you guys, because it has... Uh, it has that direct connotation to you guys. So I want you guys to hear what the Lord said. For everybody that is going to be faithful during this time, this is what the Lord told me. In Isaiah chapter 35, verses 1 and 2, it says, The wilderness and the wastelands shall be glad for them. Who's them? That's us. It says, it says And the desert shall rejoice and bloom as the rose. It shall bloom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The, the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, and the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Now, what's cool about that is, is what the Lord told me was this, that everybody who remains faithful in their giving, through their tithes and through their offerings during this time of what you would consider to be a dry time or what you consider to be a desert type of time, God said that he would bless us and he would cause the, it to bloom in the midst of the desert. And that is absolutely awesome when you think about it. That's a promise that God gave to me. He confirmed it in two different sources. And it's a promise that you can also lean upon that in this, even in the midst of all of this, God can allow you to be blessed. Can I get an amen? 
And so I'm just playing, praying that God blesses you tremendously as you continue to be faithful in your tithes and offerings and to this ministry. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just thank you once again for an opportunity to give. I thank you for the many blessings that you have given uh, your people here. And Lord, I'm just so thankful, Father, for those that you have kept in their jobs. I'm thankful, Father, for those that you have maintained, Lord. And I thank you even uh, for the blessings that you moved upon our president and allowing the uh, stimulus checks and things like that that are going out. But we need to understand that all of these things come from you. They don't come from the, the president. They don't come from anyone else. They come from you. You lean upon the heart, and I believe that our president has a heart that listens. He has people around him who are, who are talking to him and, and faith people around him. And I believe that, 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 Lord, this is something that's been put in their hearts to do. And, Lord, we just need to look at that as being a blessing that you're giving them to everyone. But let us continue to be blessed, be faithful in you as you continue to bless us. And, Father, I do pray this over every family, Lord, that is faithful to this ministry. That, Lord, you will cause their desert to bloom, Lord, in abundance, as you said. And so, Father, we just give you praise and we give you glory for all that you're doing. And the body of Christ said, amen, amen. amen. Come on, give me a, a horn blow if you believe that. All righty, let us go with our brother Pat. Let's go into worship in Jesus' name.
Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power. Our God, our God, oh, hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Oh, somebody praise him this morning. You are worthy, Lord. You are hallelujah. Worthy.
you turn it for good. Hallelujah. Well, think about that, church. Whatever you're going through, the victory's already been won. Hallelujah. And whatever the enemy has meant for your evil, God's going to turn it for good. What a hope. No matter what it is that you're going through right now in your life, whatever it is, whatever the enemy has put as a snare in your life or to trip you up, God's going to make it for good. How cool is that? What an awesome God we serve. But we have to hold on and trust the Lord. Amen. The victory's already been won. Proclaim the victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. One more time. I'm gonna see a victory. Sing it out. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the Church, I believe there's somebody that needs to just say this this morning. Lord, I turn this battle over to you. I just believe that in my heart, that somebody needs to say, Lord, I turn this battle over to you. You've been trying to fight it on your own, and you've been trying to get the victory in your own strength. And God is saying this morning, just turn the battle over to me. So that's for somebody this morning. Turn it over. Lay it down. Don't pick it back up. Lay it down and give this battle to the Lord. Because whatever the enemy is meant to be your destruction, God's going to give you victory in Jesus' name. Amen.
our God, church. He's the name above all names. What is that name? Jesus. 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 That is the name above every name. The name of Jesus. Amen. If there's any other name that should bring a smile to your face, it's Jesus. <laughs> we celebrated that he is at the right hand of the Father last week. And I believe that he's coming back soon, amen? And he is the name above all names. At that name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. <laughs> How great is our God. Amen, amen, amen. It is so good to see everybody here this morning. Thank you so very much, my brother. I tell you, it's amazing to see what God is doing in, God, in the world today. You know, when you sit there and you think about all this craziness that's going on, you know, you wonder what God is doing, but I know that he's in control, amen? We may wonder about his, the way he's doing it, the tactics by which he's doing it, but I'm, I am firmly confident in believing that he is doing and he knows exactly what he's doing. Amen. And so uh, those that are out here, I hope that this couple that came in after, afterwards, uh, I think everybody's on, but if, you do, if you're not on the radio itself, it's 88.7. It's so good to see visitors with us today. And it's good to see Brother Andy back there again this week. And we just are so thankful for everybody to be with us here this morning. And I tell you, God is so awesome. Um, I tell you, this message this morning is kind of one of those that uh, us preachers sit there and we just kind of scratch our head as it begins to unfold. And um, we start in one direction, it goes into another direction, but when it's all said and done, you know it was the divine direction, amen? And so um, I'm going to tell you, it's been one that is, um, it's kind of one of those when we're, um, I'm sure Brother Andy can contest to this and being a minister himself, but there's some, there's some sermons that once you're done with it, you just go, this is going to be fun to preach. And um, this is one of those, um, but it's going to take all kinds of twists and turns, so I need you guys to stay with me with it, amen? But I believe that it's what the Lord has really put in my heart, because as he continued to unfold it throughout this week, it made more sense as he unfolded it than it did when it started. I asked the Lord, I was saying, Lord, I need a new word from you, give me something, and I was, it was all throughout the week, I didn't get anything, and then I think it was Thursday morning or Wednesday afternoon, all of a sudden, I woke, it was probably Thursday morning because I woke up, but I woke up Thursday morning, and the word that was on my mind was another. And I was like, Lord, I'm going to need a whole lot more than that. And so as I was sitting there thinking about this, uh, this another thing, um, the Lord kind of put in my heart to research the word another. And so I'd gone online, and there was a gentleman who had put a whole bunch of scriptures together, and it was the one another's of scripture. And this is exactly what it said. It says uh, there was multiple, there was 21 different uh, sayings, but with multiple different scriptures. And I wanted us to really get an, an understanding of what this word another meant. 
Uh, in the scripture, it says, honor one another above yourselves, Romans 12 and 10. It says, admonish one another, Colossians 3 and 16. Submit to one another out of reverence to Christ, Ephesians 5 and 21. Clothe yourself with humility towards one another, 1 Peter 5 and 5. Love in harmony with one another, Romans 12 and 16, 1 Peter 3 and 8. Serve one another in love. Galatians 5 and 13, teach one another in Colossians 3, 16, instruct one another, Romans 15 and 14, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. <laughs> Can everybody say amen? <laughs> 1 Peter 4 and 9, wash one another's feet. Amen. John 13 and 14, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, <laughs> I know this one's kind of sacrilegious right now because of, uh, of the social distancing, but I thought this was pretty interesting. That scripture that said, greet one another with a holy kiss was not found once, but was actually found four times in scripture. And this is what it actually, in Romans 16 and 16, 1 Corinthians 16 and 20, 2 Corinthians 13 and 12, and 1 Peter 5 and 14. Do you think he was trying to get a point across? <laughs> I have people that are afraid to hug me and want to elbow bump me, but the word of God tells me, come and give me a holy kiss in Jesus' name. By the way, that's men, and men, men giving a, 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 the other man a kiss is what that took place of. Anyways, moving on. Number 12, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you, Romans 15 and 7. Do not slander one another, James 4 and 11. Stop passing judgment on one another, Romans 14 and 13. Forgive whatever grievances you have against one another, Colossians 3 and 13. Encourage one another daily. I thought that was interesting. Encourage one another daily, Hebrews 13, excuse me, 3 and 13 and Hebrews 10 and 25. Be patient, bearing one another in love, Ephesians 4 and 2. Be kind and compassionate to one another, Ephesians 4 and 32. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, Romans 12 and 10. Love one another deeply from the heart, 1 Peter 3 and 8. Now this one here is the one that stuck out the most. It says 10 times, love one another. That's in James 13, 34. Uh, excuse me, John 13, 34, John 13, 35, John 15, 12, John 15, 12, John 15 17, 1 John 3 and 11, 1 John 3, 23, 1 John 4 and 7, 1 John 4 and, 7, 4 and 11, 1 John 4 and 12, and 2 John 5. Can we give God glory? Now here's the thing that was real interesting as I began to meditate upon this. I asked several people today, and this is what I asked the Lord, and I asked him, I said, if I tell you to love one another, what does that mean? And almost everybody that I asked said that means love everyone. But what was real interesting about that is, is that when he spoke of loving one another, he was not speaking of loving everyone. He was speaking of loving the body of Christ, the brethren. All of those scriptures that I just read to you that talked about loving one another, admonishing one another, teaching one another, loving one another, encouraging one another, all of those had to do with the body of Christ, the brethren and the sisters. It did not have to do with everyone. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, this is what it says. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn there. This will not be our text today, but I want to open up with this scripture. If you have your Bibles, I want you to show me. Hawk, I'm throwing stuff all over the place. Hold your Bible up. Let's make our declaration. This is my Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. And can I get an amen? And this is what the scripture says in verse, or in John 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give you that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples. Notice he didn't say Christians. You will know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. What's interesting with the word my disciples, because if God is saying that, if Jesus is saying this is, this is, by doing this, they will know that you're my disciples. There are other people's disciples out there. Amen. And Jesus was saying here that they will know that you are my disciples because you have love one for another. 
Let us pray. Father, I just thank you once again for your word. I thank you for the opportunity as a pastor, Lord, and a preacher to be able to come and to, to share your word. I pray, Father, that you anoint me for, because your word is already anointed, but anoint me to speak what you have put upon my heart. Let me allow you to speak and not John to speak. And I just give you praise and I give you glory for everybody that's here. I pray that you touch their their ears to hear and their heart to receive. And we just give you all the praise and all the glory in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And the body of Christ said, Amen. All right. Now our text today is actually going to be in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 24. Now this is going to be a little bit different of a sermon. Like I said, stay with me and you'll understand what I'm what I am a, the, the message that God has really put on my heart and what I'm trying to get across. So let's start in 1 John chapter 3, starting with verse one, number 1. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we shall be called children of God. That's one thing I want you to understand right there from the beginning. That, that right, what he's saying here is what manner of love that we can be bestowed upon us that we could be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because they did not know him. When he's talking of him here, he's talking about God. The world did not know God, so the world did not know him. And the world does not know you and I because the world does not know him. Okay? It says in verse 2, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we will know when he, Jesus, is revealed. What does that mean? That means revealed in all of his glory when he returns. And it says, And we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is in all of his glories. So basically what it's saying is, is you and I will be like Jesus Christ, completely like Jesus Christ when we get on the other side. Amen? But right now we as Christians, which means Christ-like, are doing our best to live a Christ-like and represent Christ to a world that does not know him. Does that make sense? So we as Christians are to be an example of Christ to a world that does not know him. In verse number three, and it says, everyone who has this hope is, it has this hope in him, which is Jesus, purifies himself just as he is pure. The word pure there means holy and undefiled. Notice what it said there. It did not say we are purified because of him, but it says that you and I, if we have the hope that one day Jesus is coming back and you and I will be just like him, it says that you will purify yourself isn't that interesting you mean you and i have a have something to do with this it ain't like the hyper grace that's out there saying that i don't have to do anyways i can live any way that i want to it's just the blood of jesus i don't have to do nothing but it's interesting it says if you have the hope that jesus is coming back and one day you will be like him you will purify yourself now what's interesting let's go on in verse four it says whoever commits or, the, or you, in, the other word for that would be practice, and it'll make sense in a minute. But whoever commits or practices sin, also it commits and practices lawlessness. Now, I want you guys to understand the word lawlessness. Those, that word also means sin, and I'll show you that in a minute. But I need you to get that word lawlessness. It's going to make a big difference later when, when Jesus tells us something that's going to take place. Now, what does lawlessness really mean? It means ignoring God's law by action, neglect, or by tolerating wrongdoing. I like that last part, tolerating wrongdoing. By, re by unrestrained, excuse me, being unrestrained by his commands and his will. It means, it means ignoring the laws of God. Now, what are the laws of God? We know those are the Ten Commandments, right? And you hear a lot of people in the hyper grace movement that make the comment or make the make the uh, comment that we are no longer under the law, right? Because we're now under grace. But grace did not give us the opportunity to break the law. It gives us the opportunity to walk it out, the empowerment to walk out, right? It, and what's interesting is Jesus made this comment one time. He says, "If your righteousness doesn't exceed the righteousness of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees." He says that our righteousness has to exceed their righteousness. Everything that Jesus said, when you think about it, when he was talking about the law, everything he said was more difficult than what the, the original law was. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. He says, no, I say love your enemy, love those who persecute you, pray for those who persecute you. 
And the, you know, it, the, Bible, the, uh, the law says do not commit adultery. He says if you look upon a woman or a man in lust, you've already committed adultery. Everything that Jesus said was more than what the original was. But I want us to really understand that word lawlessness as we go through the word of God. Let me go back and read that. It says, so whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. There's two types of sin in the Bible. There's a sin of disobedience, and there's a sin of lawlessness. That's the only two types of sin that there is. Disobedience from the beginning in the garden and lawlessness, what we're living in today. Does that make sense? So you have the original disobedience, sin of disobedience, which was in the garden, when, when Eve and Adam disobeyed God and brought upon sin. But then you have the sin of lawlessness, and that's what we're living in these last days with. Nobody wanting to obey by the laws of God. Verse number five. And you know that he, Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and that in him... Jesus, there is no sin. The word in is very important for us to notice there. Because the, the next verse that's fixing to come, whoever abides in him. Now what does that word mean? To abide means to remain united in fellowship with Jesus Christ. So any of us who continue and remain or abide in the fellowship with Jesus Christ does not deliberately, knowingly, or habitually sin. Did y'all get that? Let me read it again. Whoever abides in him does not deliberately, knowingly, or habitually sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Now, remember a second ago I told you there's a scripture that Jesus is going to use in these last days, and he actually uses the word lawlessness, and he actually uses the word new, which is the same as the word known. In, 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 in Matthew 7, 22 and 23, it says, Many will say to me, that's Jesus, in the last days, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, Jesus will declare to them, I never knew you. Now that's going to be a, a stark reality to a lot of people. They're going to think by what they've done in the name of Jesus is going to get them into heaven. But the reality, the fact is, is what it says here that is most important is I never knew you. That word knew means intimately knowing you. It's the same word used when it says that Adam knew Eve and they conceived. That's how intimate of a, of a, of a word that is. And what Jesus says is I never knew you. And he responds this way. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Isn't that interesting? He didn't say he who practices sin. He says he who practices lawlessness. Now we need to truly understand that. So why is that so important? Because we live in an age today where we're more concerned about using grace as a covering to make excuses for our sin rather than using grace as an empowerment to walk out and do what God has commanded us to do and live a holy life and purify ourselves and make ourselves ready for Jesus Christ when he comes back so that you and I can look just like him and be just like him and he can present us to the Father spot free. Amen? Verse number seven, it says, Little children or believers, let no one deceive you or lead you astray. That is very, very important for you to understand. I need you to get this because this is going to be the greatest thing that's going to happen to God's people in the last days is deception. They're going to be deceived. And the reason you will be deceived is because you will not know the truth. Here's the truth, everybody. There is no other truth. If it's not in here, and if I don't give you, you notice as a pastor, I give more scripture than I do what John has to say. Because if it's not in here, it's not truth. If I go and preach anything that's not in here, it's a man-made fable. I'm not here to preach fables. I'm here to preach truth. Amen? Little children, do not, excuse me, let no one deceive you or lead you astray. He who practices righteousness is righteous. What does that word righteous mean? One who strives to live a consistently honorable life in private as well as in public. 
and to conform to God's precepts. I'm going to read that one more time. Righteousness. One who strives to live a consistently honorable life in private as well as in public to conform to God's precepts just as he is righteous. Verse number eight. He who sins... What does that word sin mean? Separating oneself from God and offending him by your acts of disobedience, indifference, or rebellion. I'm going to say it one more time. Sin. Separating himself or yourself from God and offending him, God, by your acts of disobedience, indifference, or rebellion. Now I'm going to go back. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. How did the devil sin from the beginning? He violated God's laws. Are y'all getting it? Anytime that you and I do not heed to what this word of God says and what God's laws are, when we do that, we are acting in the very same disobedience that Satan acted in. And it says that if we do that and that is our behavior, that we are of the devil. Now I'm going to go on. He He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, God, excuse me, the Son of God, Jesus, was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. What is the seed of God? That's God's character. See, if you are born of God, you'll have God's character. His seed has been planted in you. And he cannot deliberately, knowingly, and habitually sin because he has been born again of God. That's an interesting statement. How can we not sin? What it is, it's a statement, more of a statement saying that we should not. That should not be the purpose of our lives. If you have been born again, as Jesus said... If you've been born of the Spirit of God and the nature of God, your desire is to please God, is to live right before God. Is that making sense? So if we, if that is not our heart, then we've not been born again. We have not had the seed of God planted in our lives, and we have not been born again of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest, which means clearly identified. I want y'all to think about this for a moment. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not unselfishly love his brother. I'm going to read that again. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifested or clearly identified. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor he who does not unselfishly love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should unselfishly love one another. So we notice here that how you and I can distinguish between a child of God and one who is not a child of God is what? By what they practice. You know, it's funny because when you think about that word practice, anybody who practices, you practice to get better at it. Amen? My son made a comment the other day when he was doing his lesson. He said, There's a statement called practice makes perfect. And Josh said, no, our coach says perfect practice makes perfect. Because if you continue to practice the wrong thing, you just get really good at doing the wrong thing. It's no different here. And that's really what he's saying. If you practice sin, you get really good at it. You know how to do it. You know how to hide it. You know how to walk in it. You know how to look all Christian-like. But deep down in your heart, you know that when the doors close, you're not living as God would want you to live. And that's something we have to understand. Children of God practice righteousness. Verse number 12. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother Abel. And why did he murder him? Because his works or deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. That is a warning to you and I. If you live righteously, those that would even consider to be your brother may speak against you and murder you. And a lot of times it doesn't have to be with a, with a weapon, amen? The weapon that's in your mouth, your tongue, is more devastating than any weapon that you can do. When you speak evil against your brother, 
You can do more damage with that tongue than you could ever do with your fists. Can I get an amen? Verse number 13. Do not marvel, my brother. If the world hates you, you know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother or sister abides in spiritual death. Whoever hates his brother in Christ is a murderer at heart. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he willingly laid down his life for us, that is Jesus Christ. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren and the sisters. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother or a his brother a believer in need and shuts his heart with no compassion for him, how does the love of God abide and live in him? If you and I see our brothers and sisters in need and we go and look the other way, how does the love of God abide in us? Verse 18, my little, my little children or believers, let us not love in word or in tongue with lip service, but in deed, actions, and in truth. And by this, we know that we are of the truth and shall assure or set at rest our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence or complete assurance and boldness towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we carefully and consistently keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing to God. What's interesting, what he's saying here is a lot of people will preach and will actually quote the scriptures that um, whatsoever you ask of God, he will give you. But you notice with God, every time, if you read your word, every time that there is a promise, there is a commitment that you need to make. There's an obligation. There's a condition. And this is saying the way that you and I receive from God is that your heart is pure and it does not condemn you. Hmm. That you have, you have treated your brothers and sisters with the respect that God desires and that somebody who claims to be a child of God and having the seed of God, that you treat your brothers and sisters the way that Jesus would require you to treat it and treat them the way that, and love them the way that he loved us. Amen? And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he commanded us. Did you hear what that said? And this is his commandment, God's commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he has commanded us. Now we who keep his commandments abide in him. And him in uh, in him in him and he in him, and by this we know that he abides or remains in us by the Spirit whom he has given us, the gift of the Holy Spirit. You and I should know, and the Spirit will confirm whether or not you are a child of God. Amen. But if your spirit condemns you, as or convicts you, as we just spoke of a minute ago, then you need to make sure one of two things: whether you are a child of God. And the, and the seed of God and the transformation and the born again spirit of God is in you or if you are a child of God that you haven't done something to a brother that has offended the Holy Spirit because whether you like it or not if you offend the Holy Spirit he will remove himself from you and I know, I know that doesn't sound popular today but let me tell you something if you offended me I'd move, remove myself from you hello I'm not going to stand where someone's going to offend me. And God ain't pleased when we disobey him. And God ain't pleased when we sit there and just turn our face, face, face away from him. As I was putting this together, the Lord gave me something. And it was kind of interesting how he gave it to me. And it's actually in John, 2 John. Let me grab this out here real quick. Hopefully I didn't pour it out with everything else. Probably did. I did. All right, here's my letter from John. As I was sitting there going through it, the Lord kind of put it in my heart. He said, I want you to write a letter from John. And this is a letter from the second epistle. So John chapter 2, excuse me, Second John is what it is. It's the letter from Second John. It's the whole letter. But I want to read this to you about the elect chosen lady. 
Isn't that interesting? I want to point that out today. How many know that there's chosen ladies of God? Honk your hand, honk your horn if you're a chosen lady of God. Come on. Come on. Honk them. Amen. Listen to this. It says, the elder to the elect chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all those who have known the truth because of the truth which abides in us. And we be with us and will be with us forever. I notice how often he said the word truth there. Truth is spoken three times in that sentence. It says grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received command from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady. Not as though I write a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is that, excuse me, this is love, that we will walk according to his commandments. Have you noticed that every time he speaks of loving one another, one, he's talking about the believers. Number two, he talks about and connects the commandments with it. Have y'all noticed that? You cannot love God effectively until you truly fear God. And you cannot love God effectively until you truly obey his commandments and the word of God. Amen. The word of truth. <laughs> Continuing on, it says, this is the commandment that as we have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. And that commandment is love. For many de deceivers posing as Christians have gone out into the world who did not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an anti-Christ. Now this is fixing to hit right dead in the middle of my message, and I'm fixing to rock everybody with what God showed me. But this is the part I want us to truly understand. The deception that's going to be coming from those who are deceivers and anti-Christ. Not the anti-Christ, but the anti-Christ spirit that is operating in the sons of in the sons of, of devil. Hold on a second. Let me get back to my scripture here for just one moment. I want to read read a scripture that he had given me for this. In 1 John chapter 2, 18 through 19, it says, Little children, it is the last hour, which means the end of this age. And as we have heard that the Antichrist, the one who will oppose Christ and attempt to replace him is coming. So there is an antichrist and he is coming. How many believe that? Now well, listen, I'll take it a step further than that. It says, he is coming and even now many antichrists have come by which we know that is in the last, that with that, so let's try it again. By which we know that it is the last hour. So as we know, as the last hour comes, there will be many antichrists, those that speak against Christ, those that deny Christ. There will be many in the last days that are doing that. How many believe that's taking place today? That's how close we are today, guys, that we are in this last hour. Verse 19, it says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. There's that word manifest again. And remember we said you can know the difference between those that are the children of God and the children of the devil because they will be manifested. Let me tell you something. If someone is an antichrist, speaks against Christ, denies that Jesus came in the flesh, denied that Jesus is coming back, that is an antichrist. And let me tell you something. It is a child of the devil. I'm just being real. I just showed you scripture that said that, did it not? Now I'm going to proceed on. In 1 John 4, 2 and, or 2 and 3, it says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every, every spirit that confess the fact that Jesus Christ has actually come in the flesh is of God. Did y'all get that? By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. 
And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is already in the world. I'm telling you, church, I believe the Antichrist himself is already born, he's already raised, and he's ready to come. He's going to step on the scene more quickly than you guys can ever imagine. I had a brother come to me just this past week and said, have you noticed on, in the news? I don't watch a lot of news. And I said, no. He said they actually have now been petitioning to start making sacrifices in the, on the Temple Mount. They've already got the, the, the heifers and they've already got the lambs. And they're petitioning now to start. Do y'all realize how close we are to Jesus Christ coming? I'm telling you, church, we better wake up. The signs that are taking place all around us, you better get out. I'm fixing to talk about one here in a minute. It's going to rock you. So here we go. Let's go on. Let's go back to, to um, 2 John. Verse number 8, it says, Look to or watch yourselves that we do not lose those things we have worked for by that we may receive a full reward, the reward of a faithful believer. In verse number nine, whoever transgresses or goes ahead and does not abide or remain in the doctrines and the teachings of Christ. Did y'all get that? Not the doctrines and the teachings of Buddha or Allah or Krishna, but the, gui the, the, the guidings and the, the doctrine and the teachings of Christ. Whoever transgresses and does not abide and remain in the doctrines and the teachings of Christ does not have God. And he who abides or remains in the doctrines of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring the doctrine, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, listen to me, church, do not receive him into your house. And i got to say this. The Lord had me write down the word right next to this scripture, televangelist. There's a lot of script. There's a lot of people going into people's houses right now through the television. And let me tell you, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of antichrist spirits that are being spread right now through the television. And this says right here, very, very clear. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine right here, everyone in the car see it, right? If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine that's been taught by Jesus Christ, the Holy Word of God. Do not let them into your home. Turn the TV off. Go find your Bible and clarify what they're saying. Amen? Nor greet him. Now listen to this. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. If you promote and you support somebody who is not preaching the Word of God, from the word of God, if you support and you send your finances to someone who doesn't preach the word and say that Jesus Christ was born of the Father, he was born of a, he was born of the Virgin Mary, he was he, he was crucified, he was risen again, and he's coming back again. If they did, and he did not come in the flesh and walk on this earth, God in the flesh, if they're not preaching that, and if they're not preaching and telling you to live and abide, abide what he has commanded in this Bible and his father has commanded in this Bible, you better turn them off. You better quit supporting them. Or you yourself, as it just said, will, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to mis, misconstrue God's word. For he who greets him shall share in his evil deeds. Verse number 12. Having many things to write to you, I do not wish to do so. So with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. At the bottom of that, the Lord had me put a scripture down there. In John 14 and 6. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ is the one who said that. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father. No one goes to heaven. No one has eternal life except through me. Why is that important? 
Let me proceed on and I'll tell you. And this is my closing. 1 John 4, 7 through 11 says this, Beloved, let us love one another for God is of love. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifest towards us, that God has sent his only, his only, his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and has sent his son to be the perpetuation. Now, the interesting thing about this word perpetuation, listen to this, is the act of gaining or regaining favor or goodwill of someone or something. Grace. By the grace of God, he sent his son that you and I could regain or to gain favor with God. Amen. So Jesus became the perpetuation for our sins. Verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love unselfishly one another. Here's the thing. As I began to put this together and as I, and I, and I think I've been very clear and I've been all over the word of God and I have not said anything to you so far about what John thinks. Amen. Can I get an amen? This is not about what I think. It's about what the word of God says. I will be held accountable as a pastor for what I've taught you or what I've shared with you. So it better be the word of God. And it better be multiple scriptures that confirm out of the mouth of two or three, right? So I don't just give you one or two verses and then expound on it. That, that's not going to grow you. It's, the Lord told me one time, well, pastors need to understand when I take the pulpit on this Sunday morning, this will be all the word that most people will get all week long. So if I only give you one or two scriptures a week and there's 52 weeks in a year, y'all getting what I'm saying? Just, just 100 plus scriptures you're going to get the whole year. But in this one sermon, I probably have given you at least that. Are you getting what I'm saying? So what's important? What I have to say or what God has to say? What God has to say, amen? Now listen to this. As I began to close this, I said, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? And this is what he told me. The greatest way for the, Christ, for the child of God or the children of God to show our love for one another is three things. And the three things are going to basically be the summary of this whole sermon. Number one, not to let each other be deceived by false teachers and antichrist who come out of the church and teach their own false doctrines. Did you notice it said they came out from among us, but they weren't of us? The Lord told me about six or eight weeks ago as I was praying over my church. I said, Lord, I don't understand. I'm trying to bring everybody together. I'm trying to go in the right direction, but there seems to be such a fight. And this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. Not everybody sitting on your pews are sheep. Not everyone sitting on your pews are sheep. But the sheep will follow the shepherd. Not everyone professing to be a Christian is a Christian. Let me restate that. Not everyone professing to be a Christian is a disciple. Jesus didn't make Christians. He made disciples. And what was a disciple? Those that listened and obeyed the teachings and the doctrine of Jesus Christ. That's why he said they'll know that you're my disciple. Because there's other people out there making disciples. Do you not think that every preacher that is preaching this morning is not making disciples? But the question is, are we creating more disciples of Jesus Christ or are we be creating disciples of John Kreinbrand or any other minister that's out there? I don't want to create disciples for John Kreinbrand. 
It's not about my kingdom. It's about his kingdom. Amen? So we need to be creating disciples for Jesus Christ. And the only way that we can create disciples for Jesus Christ is to teach them what Jesus Christ said. And not allow them to be deceived by those who are going to come in so many different names. And they'll even come in the name of Jesus. But they will not know him. The second thing he told me. The second greatest thing or the greatest way that child of God can show their love for one another is to tell the truth. That's the greatest way for a child of God to love you. It's the greatest way as me as a pastor to love you is to tell you the truth. And most of the time you ain't going to want to hear it. Because it will not allow you to feel comfortable in the lifestyle that you're living. It will not allow you to justify the sin or the feeling that you have. And therefore, you do not want to hear my truth. Because my truth comes from right here. I was talking to somebody yesterday. I said, I do not know how to preach or to counsel anybody other than the word of God. Because that's how God counsels me. I don't ask God to make what I feel and confirm my feelings. I go to his word to make sure that my feelings confirms him. Does that make sense? So the greatest thing that we can do is tell the truth. So here's some truth. You cannot continue to practice sin and go to heaven. Those that practice righteousness are righteous. Those who practice sin are sinners. And you're not a sinner saved by grace. If you are born of God, you have his nature, his seed has been planted in you, and you're no longer a sinner. You can't sin. We just read it. I, I, I'm, I'm not making this up. I just read it to you. So you cannot continue to live in sin, continue to practice sin, and go to heaven. Second truth. Hmm. Buckle, put that seatbelt on. This is the first time I can actually say put the seatbelt on. You guys can actually do it. Isn't that kind of funny? <laughs> Anyways, put it on. Whew. Church members, remnant, begin to pray. I'm fixing to step in some. Okay. This week, I, I had Facebook. Y'all know how much I dislike it. But I'm being obedient. Lord told me to, to get on it, so I'm on it. Well, this week I was actually was reading a, a post in regards to a council called Interfaith Council. Interfaith Council. I-N-T-E-R Faith Council. As I began to read this Facebook post, it kind of grieved me in my spirit because I really didn't know what it meant. So I said, you know what? Let me just go ahead and research that. So I typed in that great old Google. And as I began to research interfaith, this thing came up on YouTube. It's called the Interfaith Dialogue. And there was a YouTube video called Breaking the Taboos of Interfaith Interfaith Dialogue by TEDx Do. And as I began to listen to this, there were three men that were on this stage, and they called themselves the Interfaith Amigos. And these three men, one was a Muslim, one was a rabbi, and the other one, I don't know if he was a priest, they called him pastor, I don't know. But anyways, they would have a dialogue, and they went through this whole dialogue. And this is exactly, I'm going to actually quote these quotes. So I wrote these verbatim, so I'm not misguiding anybody in this. And this is what the first question was asked. It says, why is interfaith dialogue so difficult? And this was the answer. The confusion 
of the particular and the universal. Hmm. So I just sat there and continued to listen on. And this is, quote, Every authentic spiritual path is an avenue to a shared universal. And I quote, But the universal is greater than any particular path. And I quote, when the particular path assumes it owns the universal. Now when he's speaking of universal, he's speaking of God. When he's speaking of particular, he's speaking of the denominations or religions. Are y'all getting me, okay? When the particular path assumes it owns the universal, we are in for serious global difficulties. Now I have a problem with that. I just read you a scripture that says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him, right? Now what's interesting, if we was to just sit there and remove the word that he actually used here as path and put way, the universal is the greater than any particular way. When the particular way assumes it owns the universal, we are in serious global difficulties. I venture to say, Christians, children of God, when we forget that Jesus is the way, we've got difficulties. Listen to me, church. We're in the last hour. What's going to separate us in these last days is going to be the name of Jesus Christ. Nobody's offended by God. Because they don't understand there's a difference between a big G and a little G, God. I serve the big G. But when you start calling Jehovah, it gets offensive. Are y'all getting me? Jesus is the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. That's what it says here. And that's what I believe. The question today is, do you believe this? Interfaith dialogue. That means every faith, whether it believes this or not, comes together and comes into an agreement that we will speak what does not offend others. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. And the sword is the word of God. Church, we better make a decision which side of the line we're going to be on. We better make a decision who we're going to make counsel with. We better make sure who it is we're letting into our house. And you better make sure whose house you're going into. Whether it be the White House or any other house. Because if we go into the wrong house and make an agreement with the wrong devil, we will reap the same benefits as their wickedness. Are you getting me? Church, Hope made a mention this past week about the number 40 and how they were talking about 30, 40 or 39. It may be 39. I don't know. But how that number meant change. And everybody keeps saying, it's not going to be church as usual. I will reiterate that fact. It is no longer going to be church as usual. I'm telling you right now, church, everything has shifted. When the government can dictate whether or not I can be in God's house because of a six foot distance and tell me that I have to be out, which I'm, I'm thank you Father I got beautiful sunshine I got beautiful people in front of me I'm all, I'm all about this brother Andy can rejoice in this he's with an evangelist he did this under a tent this is how it started guys this is how it's going to end isn't it interesting 
I'd like for Jesus to come back right now. Number three. So number one, the greatest way that a child of God can show love for one another is not to let one another be deceived by false teachers and antichrists that come out of the church and teach their own false doctrines. Number two, number two, to tell the truth that you cannot continue to live and to practice sin and go to heaven. There is, no, there is not many ways to God. There is only one way to God. It's Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? And hold on. Everyone is not a child of God. I just proved that to you, right? Everyone is not a child of God. We like to twist those scriptures. But I just read to you what a child of God does. What the difference between a child of God and a child of Satan is. So if you can if you can distinguish clearly between a child of God and a child of Satan by what they do, then not everybody can be a child of God. Amen? I, that's just the word. I'm, I'm not saying anything that I didn't just already read to you. But here's the good news. If you confess Jesus as Lord today, you can truly be a child of God. <laughs> Romans 8, 8 through 13 said it this way. But what does it say? The word is near to you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord recognizing his power, authority, and majesty as God. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes in Christ as Savior, and unto righteousness or justification and with the mouth confession. What does that mean? You openly confess your faith. If you will confess with your mouth unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him, that is Jesus, will not be ashamed. For there is no distinction Distinct, distinction between a Jew and Gentile or Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich, abounding in blessings to all who call upon him. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Can I get a big old horn? This morning, here's the message. If you and I truly love one another, we will not allow each other to be deceived. We will not allow each other to live in error and to practice sin. If we truly love one another, we will speak the truth. And let people know you cannot live in sin and make it to heaven. We will speak the truth that Jesus is the only way, as the Word of God said it very clear. And not everybody is a Christian. Not excuse me, not everybody is a child of God. It seems like everybody today is a Christian, but not everyone's a child of God. But if you today you desire to become a child of God. Some may say, well, Pastor, you're preaching a whole lot of hate. I just told you, if I truly love you, I will preach the truth. Jesus loved everybody who came. He was crucified for preaching the truth. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus came preaching the truth. John the Baptist came preaching repentance and preaching the truth and he was beheaded for it. Jesus came preaching the truth and he was crucified for it. And all the disciples other than John died as martyrs preaching the truth. So I give you the truth this morning. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way to the Father. So today, if you want to go to heaven and you want to make Jesus Lord of your life, I want you to bow your head and repeat after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus into the world to walk this world, to go through the things that I go through that so that he could understand what the things that I suffer in. Thank you, Lord, for being willing to die on the cross for me. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I repent of my sin. I repent of my practice in lawlessness and disobedience. I repent, which means to turn away from my old life. And I want you to become Lord of my life. I give to you whatever life I have left. I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. Which means I give complete authority and I surrender all to you. Lead me and guide me. Teach me your ways and your doctrine. That I may be pleasing to the Father. Today I confess my sin. And I ask you to forgive me. And to become Lord of my life. Thank you. For making me a child of God. Allow your spirit, your Holy Spirit to come into me right now and prepare this vessel for what you have for me to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Father, I also want to pray for those that may be professing to be Christians, professing to be believers, but they're still living in their lives. They're still living as if they're not. They're still living in areas of their life that they, they know is in complete rebellion and disobedience to the Word of God, to your teachings, Lord Jesus. And this morning, they had the Holy Spirit convict their heart. I ask them right now to repent, to ask the Lord to forgive them and recommit their lives, Lord, right now to you. Father, this is not an easy thing to do, I understand, but neither is these last days. We're going to have to make tough decisions. But Lord, let us not be deceived by false prophets or false teachers who are telling us that we can continue to live in sin and see your face. So Father, I pray for them right now. Help them to recommit their lives to you today. Father, I thank you for this word and I thank you for this message because I know it was from you. And Father, I just pray that it not fall on deaf ears but that it go in as a seed and gets planted into their hearts. And even as they leave today, Lord, let, let the Holy Spirit continue to bring it back to them. I, I preach it in faith. I pray it in faith. In Jesus' precious name.
your heart today. In all that you do, you want to honor God. You want to honor his word. How many believe that that word was from the Lord? If you get a chance and you believe that, share it with somebody today. I believe it needed to be out there. And I'm so thankful for everybody coming out today. It's so awesome to be able to see that we can all still come together in Jesus' name. Amen. And God honors us with the beautiful weather that he does. He's an awesome, awesome God. So let me pray over you. Father, I thank you for your church. I am such a blessed pastor. I thank you for those that came out to worship with us, Lord, and to receive your word. Thank you for my brother Andy and his church, and I just pray your blessings over them, his lovely bride. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would just bless their family and bless their church. Father, I pray for all the churches that are in our, our county, Lord, that you would bless them and pray for them, Lord, today, that you would touch them and that they were, were having a great time in you today. But, Father, I pray protection over your church here at the Lancaster Church of God and all of those that have made, made Lancaster Church of God home on the TVs. I pray, Father God, that you would bless their homes, you would keep them, protect them, that you would bless them. I pray, Father, that your peace would be in their home, but more importantly, in their hearts. And I pray, Father, till we have the opportunity once again to come together to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and to share in the wonderful truth that is found in your word. I give you all the praise and all the glory that the body of Christ said, Amen. Remember, every day from 12 to 1, I do a book reading. We're starting a brand new book come Monday called Good or God. A lot of us settle for good when we can have God. And not everything that is good is God. <laughs> so that's from 12 to 1. And then every evening at 7 o'clock, there's somebody from our ministry team that is doing uh, is ministering and i've got to call him out brother derek is the one who actually teaches on sun or excuse me tuesday evenings for the men's bible study and hope just left him out there dry so i wanted to go ahead and mention him <laughs> love you brother i thank everybody who was here on tv and everybody who came to visit and i just pray that all of you guys have a blessed week and god's blessing be with you in jesus name we love you jesus loves you and hey Love one another in Jesus' name. God bless.